welcome 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 everyone um to another faith friday video um i wasn't planning to come on just now i was i was thinking about coming on um you know in the earlier in the day for me um later on in the in the day rather uh in the day rather because right now it's 3 55 a.m in the morning um we not too long ago uh completed our uh bible listen party on the bible listen party channel we just went to the book of deuteronomy all of it uh, tonight it was night number uh, six right day number six and uh we've been going through uh the bible we're going to the entire bible in 40 days so of course we, we began in genesis and we've been we're working our way through and it's night number six we just did deuteronomy tomorrow we're going to be doing the book of uh uh joshua listening to it and following along in our bibles and um just a message rose up out of just going to the book of De deuteronomy just now when i I just felt compelled to bring this um, today. Um, I have some some Bible scripture here. We're going to go through. Uh, we're going to go through some of them, uh, you know, quite extensively. Um, but I definitely want to do this. I really believe the Lord is leading me uh, to do this right now. And we do Bible uh, Faith Fridays every Friday, sometimes Saturday my time in Japan GST. Uh, but of course, you guys can see again it's three fifty six now in the morning. Very, very early in the morning, but I felt like I had to come on and bring this after doing a three-hour uh, Bible listen party in the book of Deuteronomy. I'm going to pray, then I'm going to open up um, and just go through what I want to share with you guys today. Father, again, I come before you in, in the mighty name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, O oh God. I present myself before you, Abba Father, to bring forth that which I believe you want to share with your people that will come in contact with this live stream. Lord, you're holy, you're worthy, you're righteous, you're just, and you're true. I pray, Father, that your words will proceed from my mouth, Lord God, by the unction of your Holy Spirit, in the name of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, and own that which you'd like to convey, Lord God, will, will be conveyed. It will come across clearly, Lord God, without confusion. Above Father, without any distraction, above Father, that you, Lord God, will speak through me and use me as you see fit in Jesus' name. For your glory, above Father, I pray that, pray that you bring conviction and clarity, above Father, and guidance and direction, to your people and, and even minister to my own heart as well, O oh God, and let your perfect will alone be done and established in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The fear of God is something that in the in the like our day and age, modern age, modern church is fighting words. You know, and I'm a person that of course is the recipient and the beneficiary of the love of God, all of us, right? God is love. And of course, the Bible talks about the fact that the goodness of God leads to repentance. The goodness of God in relation to his mercies, his patience, his long suffering, which is calling us to himself, patiently waiting while we're in the midst of sin, patiently waiting while we're in the midst of darkness to come to himself. He's waiting for you and I when we're in the midst of darkness, right? To come. While we could have been consumed and died in our sins a long time ago, he's waiting, he's calling. He's sending someone to minister to you. He's sending someone to evangelize, to proselytize, to get you to come in. He's sending somebody. Your parents, a friend, a stranger, someone online, someone on the TV, someone on the radio. All these different ways you might feel like, okay, you're running, running, running into these things all the time. But you're wondering like, okay, I don't know, like, these preachers and these evangelists and these people, these Christians. And you're running into them again and again and again. And you're not realizing that God is doing something. That all that you're experiencing right now is the mercy of God. That's trying to bring you to repentance. The mercy, the love beckoning you to come in, to come deeper. But yet still, you are ignoring all the signs. Forsaking your own mercy. And those of us who, who are in the church with one foot in, one foot out, living a life of immorality, living all different sort of ways, not even attempting to walk in the precepts that we find in the New Testament. Again, loving the Lord our God with our, all our heart, mind, soul, strength, our neighbor as ourselves, and all that our Lord and Master Jesus Christ preached. It's optional. I was going through Deuteronomy from the beginning to the end, 34 chapters. We went through it today. And Moses summarized 
the journey from Egypt to the promised land, uh, well, to almost the promised land because he never got to enter in it. He died before. But he summarized the journey thus far. And then he went into the blessings and the cursing and just all the things that the Lord had for the children of Israel if they were obedient and all the curses that will fall upon them, the consequences if they were disobedient. And oftentimes the list, like for instance in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, the curses were extensive from, I believe it's verse 1 to verse 14 of Deuteron Deuteronomy 28, blessings. Then from 15 all the way through to 68, curses. And verse, verse 58 says, right? It says, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, that thou mayest fear this glorious and and fearful name the Lord thy God. While I was listening to it, so this is what was happening to me, right? Because again, when we do the Bible in party, the Bible comes alive, right? And it's like, I was listening to it and I'm following along in my Bible and I just felt this, this sort of, it's almost like I felt, felt like it was me, like the, 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 this sort of like conviction and fear and, and uh, uh, you're just thinking about just who God is, like in, in terms of like, the blessings are beautiful when you're reading it. Beautiful blessings. And everyone wants that, right? And there's a certain way that we, we ought to be in order to be the recipients of these blessings. But then there, there are the curse, curses, which are so extensive, just unimaginable, that I was like, man, imagine if I was one of the, the, the Israelites back in the day and I was hearing this, this the, the sort of like fear and conviction to to make sure I'm walking the straight and narrow path would keep me in 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 line. I would think, I would hope, right? Because I'm like, man, like. So of course, when you look on the other side, it's almost like the promises of God today, and of course the damnation of hell, and we have a choice, right? We look at heaven, and the new earth, and all that God has for us, and it's beautiful, and He He has actually given us a way to access this, right? For our names to be written in the, in the book of life. And then, of course, on the other side, when we disobey, there is the damnation of hell that awaits. Terrifying things. But again, there are people who still go the way that leads to damnation. The Israelites, of course, they actually disobeyed and they suffered the consequences and all the curses that were listed. They suffered because they disobeyed. But it's the fear that keeps many of them in line. It's like, even myself, the way I felt, I'm like, man, I would never want these curses to befall me if I was there. And I was thinking to myself, man, like just that fear alone, the fear of who God is, his power, his omnipotence, his ability to enact his will I says, like, whenever he wants, he, he, he can do it. That within itself would keep me, or when I look at that, because of that potential consequence, it, 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 it would make me think twice about disobeying the Lord. And it's not unlike in where, where, wherever we live, right? Rules of the road. You see a policeman, you're, you're speeding, you start slowing down. Why are you slowing down? Why? You were driving fast beyond the speed limit just now for the last 10 minutes, but you see a police car in the distance, so you start to slow down. Why? Of course, it's the fear of the consequence. I'm going to get a ticket. This is going to happen. That's going to happen all these things, right? Someone provoke you. You might feel like you want to fight or something, whatever it is, but you know that you can't really because if you do this, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. The consequence causes you not to act out your feelings, and do the things that you want to do. So there's a benefit. There's a, a function of fear. There are so many things that we feel like we don't want to do. I don't feel like working today. You know what? I'm so tired. Oh, man, so much, so much is going on. I just don't want to go. But you know if you don't go, there will be consequences. So in order to avoid the consequence, you go. 
there are bills that need to be paid. Uh, if you don't pay the bills, they're like, well, I want to use the money for this. I want to go on a vacation, but I got to pay this thing. But you, you pay it because if you don't pay it, then you don't have the things that you need. Your light is going to be cut off. Your internet is going to go. All these things. So you pay it. So our physical and natural lives are governed by fear of consequences. And that keeps us in alignment. If there were no uh, threat of jail and prison time and all these things, people would just do anything. But we think twice, we stop ourselves because we're like, wait, I can't really go all the way because if I act this out, if I do what I feel like doing right now, I know there's a consequence if I get caught in all these things and it makes it just maybe calm down for a second and maybe think about a different way of maybe resolving the conflict. So throughout the Bible, we see where, again, the fear of, uh, Proverbs 9, 10 says what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when we understand who God is, his power, his might, his strength, then we understand, then we can, again, orient ourselves to really understand the hierarchy of creation, the hierarchy of existence, the hierarchy of the spirit world who is actually in control, and then we can act accordingly. If, again, that's where wisdom comes from, but if we don't have the fear of the Lord, we're walking in the midst of folly. There's no reverential fear. We don't obey anything. Everything that he says is optional. We're like, hey, I'm not afraid. I do anything I feel like. But if, but if we had the fear of the Lord, which again is a beginning of wisdom because so if we're devoid of the fear of God, we are foolish. So, so there's a function to the fear of the Lord. The knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this is a fear, yes, a sort of reverential fear, but also a sort of terror. Understanding, understanding that God has the power to do whatever he feels like, but at the same time, yes, in his presence, fullness of joy, right hand, pleasures forevermore. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Just like when, when we're, we're going through the book of Deuteronomy and we're seeing the blessings and the cursing, the curses, the blessings are beautiful, but there's another side Like the sight of the Lord that's beautiful is beautiful. But the sight again, the sight of consequence is terrifying. So just as beautiful and majestic and, and just alluring on the other side of light, the beauty, the beauty, the blessings just as equally. The next side is as equally terrifying. So the goodness is extreme. And also the terror is also extreme. When we look at the beauty of heaven and we look at the terror of hell. And we're living in an age where, again, all these things are optional. God indeed is love. But that's, that's all we hear, like God is love and no one talks about the consequence. I'm going to get to some, some scriptures now to actually show again the reality of what it means and why the fear of God is necessary. The fear of God that prevents you from willfully walking into that place and meeting that person and committing fornication when you say you're a born again believer because you're just like, hey, there's no fear there to, to, to let you stop and think twice. It's almost like, like for instance, if, if you know that that knew that that person had like a, you know, a STI, STD, whatever. That fear of contracting that, for instance, will probably stop you from actually walking. So that fear, again, as a function, oh, I can't go there because if I do this, this is going to happen to me. And we've lost the fear of God in our generation. We've lost it. You have people shooting street preachers on the street. People can't even really evangelize. There's, there's like more danger it's more dangerous to go out and reach people in some countries because people are devoid of the fear of god people people are burning down churches doing all these things there's no fear of god at all 
None whatsoever. Because no one preaches it. 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, Apostle Paul, knowing the terror of the Lord, New Testament, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What terror of the Lord? Have you heard this preached? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we are inveigled and catapulted by what? We are, we are impelled by what? The knowledge of knowing the terror, the knowledge of the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's not just the beauty. Again, the beauty is extreme. The goodness is extreme. The blessing is extreme. But also the curses are extreme. The terror are also extreme. And the fear of God will keep us in alignment. Just like a parent to a child, when you reverence your father again, oh, daddy's coming. Uh, I got to make sure I'm doing the right things. And then you learn, you go into Proverbs as, as well, when it talks about how to raise a child, there are certain things that causes someone to actually act right and move in a certain direction. And God clearly is not an abuser. So again, the fear of the Lord, when the Lord says something, he means what he says. Matthew 10, 28, New Testament our Lord and Master's words. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is fear God, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is our Lord and Master Jesus Christ saying, don't fear man, because of course, a lot of people are afraid of dying, are afraid of being killed. Maybe everybody. He said, no, don't, don't fear them. Y'all fear that, but don't fear that. I'll tell you who to fear. Fear him rather. Talking about God here, again, New Testament, Matthew 10, 28. Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's, that's Jesus, our Lord, speaking about the Father. So we're not talking about just the Old Testament here. We're talking about God. And again, the function and why the fear of God is necessary. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture that's going to be a little bit lengthy. Like It's going to be like 20 verses in Matthew 23. We're going to read that. I was just going through it and it was speaking to me I was, again. The book of Deuteronomy was speaking to me so strong. And I was like, man, like you go through. So we just completed, of course, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, we're about to go to, to Joshua just now. And it's like, there's so many things you learn. And even with these things, there were men like Noah, men like Abraham. All these people, Moses, that actually lived in the Old Testament in a manner in which the Lord saw these people as righteous. He saw these people as men who were who obeyed his voice. With the little that they had, they still had a posture of heart of, of obedience. And I've been guilty of being disobedient. Quite a lot, actually. And when you start reading the word, you start understanding who God really is. And you're not dependent upon what someone else is telling you. When you go through the word yourself, you see a pattern. You get greater understanding. You ask the Lord to please, Lord, open up my understanding as you did the apostles. And you're going through the word and you're understanding things. And it actually has an impact and effect on your life, your walk. You learn things and it actually impacts the way you move. I'm just saying, like, we're not even trying. We're not even trying. And the fear of God, we, we need that godly fear. It helps. It really, really helps us to walk as we ought to walk. The 
there are doctrines out there that don't even talk about this as a possibility at all. And because of this, people are living in a manner in which when the time comes and the Lord says, depart from me, I never knew you, people are going to be shocked out of their minds because, again, they're living in a life where, oh, the, 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 the beauty of the Lord, the extreme blessings. Yes, God does things on another level, the good, but also when the terror comes into play, people are going to be shocked because, again, their view of the Lord is lopsided. And they said, no, the God of the New Old Testament, I don't know who this is, but again, the Lord is saying, fear him who can do this. And this is in the New Testament, actually. Jesus is saying this. And then Paul is actually saying, knowing the terror of the Lord, New Testament, we persuade men. So we're trying to save them from something, understanding what's possible. And of course, you know, again, when it comes down to walking out what the Lord wants us to do and living in a manner in which we are pleasing to Jesus and we're walking after him and we're following him, indeed, indeed is something that comes with so many blessings. Again, just like when we're going through the, the Bible and even today in Deuteronomy, there are so many blessings, so many beautiful things. And you'd wonder and think to yourself, why would they jeopardize this and then suffer all these, this consequence, like, why? And it's oftentimes when they get comfortable, because Moses said that the Lord spoke to Moses, and he actually wrote this song, and he was singing the song, uh, Deuteronomy 32, again about when they get comfortable, and everything is going well, and they're all right, and all these things, then they'll forget. And then they'll start serving the gods, or some foreign gods, strange gods, all these things start disobeying and walking away, because everything is going okay. And then the judgment of the Lord will, will descend upon their heads. And the consequences is almost, is unbearable. Because when I'm reading it, I'm like, I'm not even there. And I'm like, man, wow. Like, I'm like, Lord, wow. Like just reading those things, it's like that alone. And again, you don't even have to go there because the blessings are just so beautiful. Why would you even think of looking at these things and these things being a possibility? You're like, oh my, why would you be tempted? To live in a manner in which you would be the recipient of these things. And today, those without the church, outside of the church, are living in such a manner. Don't fear God. They'll say anything. They'll do anything. It doesn't matter. You, you could be on the street trying to like share the word. All these things happen to you. People are burning Bibles, tearing, all, all sorts of stuff, stuff happening. And then again, some people who are actually ignorant, there is mercy because God understands, okay, like the city of Nineveh, okay, these people don't understand. They're, they're so ignorant. There's mercy for them. Just like when Paul was persecuting the Christians, he said he was, he received mercy because he did it ignorantly. So there are people who have no clue, no idea that they're actually doing blasphemous things. But there are people who know better, but they're still doing it. And those people, the, the consequence will be greater. So even just like us who say we know the Lord or know the word or what he requires because we've read it and we're followers of Jesus, if we know what's wrong and what's right and we still decide to do that which is wrong, there will be a greater punishment for those who knew the Lord's will and never did it versus someone who didn't know it but still did wrong. Because again, there's no fear of the Lord. If you actually thought there was a consequence, then maybe, just maybe, we would start acting right. In my personal life, to give you an example of just like, even how that kind of has worked and in my life, even now, like I'm living through this, is where there was a moment, I, and I told you guys about this, a period where I actually was really living for the Lord truly, like seeking first the kingdom, living that way 100%. And the Lord allowed me to enter into a place where I had a relationship and a connection with, with the Lord that, that I've never had before. I, I've never had that before. And it was a, such a beautiful place. I never knew it existed. I never knew that we could get so close to the Lord where he would speak to us and really guide us and be our teacher. And guess what happened? I got swept away by the cares of this life and then I lost my place. And it's been a journey and a battle to get back there. It's almost like twice as hard or four times as hard to actually get back to that place. 
And just understanding that I could actually, or any Christian, obviously, could get to that place after seeking the Lord and, and really trying, Lord, I'm, I'm pursuing you. And I, you actually get a glimpse and then you lose that place when you understand how hard it is to get back there. Because one, the devil is putting reinforcement to stop you because he realized, oh, this one broke through the ranks. He's, get, he's, getting, too, he's getting too close to the, to the Lord. We got to stop him. Let reinforcement put more things there to prevent him from reaching. So just the thought, the, well, one, the regret. Because you're doing the same things, but you're not getting the same results. So you understand that the Lord now gave you an opportunity. There's still mercy, of course, but you messed it up. So now you have to learn a lesson of the value of the pearl of great price. So now you've got to labor and you're trying to get there. And you're like, Lord, okay. And then you, then you understand. So, so the next time, the next time the Lord give you the opportunity, you will seize that opportunity and hold it so tight because you do not want to lose that place. Oftentimes we don't understand what we have. We take things for granted, just like people who take people in their lives who are good to them for granted until they lose them, then they understand. In Jamaica, they have this, uh, this saying that goes, like a cow, like a cow doesn't know the use of its tail until it's gone. Or until fly comes. When the fly comes, then he knows the use of the tail. So all these things that we're, we're receiving, we don't understand what we have. So fear of consequence, the fear of God is so necessary. To understand, oh, I can't allow my eyes to look at this thing. Because there is a consequence. The Lord is actually watching me right now. Oh, I can't do this. I can't let these thoughts actually live in my mind because God sees my thoughts. He, he hears my thoughts. There's a consequence if I actually live in this thing or do all these things, but there's no consequence. So those outside of the church are living in a manner in which there's no consequence. They recognize the consequence in the world system. And even they themselves in their own lives have standards and they're like, okay, you can't do this, you can't do that. If they have a business, they know how their employees should operate, etc. But when it comes on to the, to, to the Lord, first of all, some of them don't believe, but then there's no consequence. Oh, there's no rules, there's no standards, anything goes. And those, of course, some of us in the church as well, it's, it's the same, same thing. We can receive the blessings, but when we go outside of Scripture, uh, or disobey rather, there's no consequence. So we feel as though anything goes. Anything goes, I can do whatever, and hey, there's no consequence, even though the Bible says there are consequences. When we actually read it, we understand that um, there's no free meal in that sense. We understand that, okay, sin has a consequence. There's a price for sin. And we willingly run into it all the time. Willingly, not even saying, we're not even trying. We're not even trying at all. Even though God is in the room, even though God is with us at every single moment in time, and those of us who know better, there's still mercy. Again, that's the goodness of the Lord. It's drawing us, leading us to repentance, to repentance, long-suffering patience, but we take it for granted, take it for granted, take, take it for granted. There's no more fear. So one, we'll never get to reach a place of being fruitful. We, we'll never get to reach a place where our fruit has been perfected. Because again, we're living a life where again, it's not up to the standard that God wants. That's one. And then also the consequence of sin. I want to read something from Matthew 23, and this is the word of our master. But give me two seconds. And this is a bit long, but hear, hear, hear this, right? Matthew 23, 13 to 33. But warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you. So woe again. Woe unto you. 
So it's a warning. Why is he warning them? There's a reason for it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense to make a long prior, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. The greater damnation. Also, there's a greater consequence. The greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you, made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You, you fools, and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold, and whosoever shall swear by the altar, is, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sworeth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sworeth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. Undone. When the Lord is teaching, oftentimes, almost always, he gives again the blessings and he gives again the consequences. He gives the results of righteousness and also the consequence of unrighteousness. It's always a balanced message. We understand you blind guides, verse 24, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup of the platter and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's or dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of, of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. And oftentimes we think we're better than these people as well. Oh, if it was me, if I was there, I wouldn't do these things. But again, just like them, the same mindset. He said again, 31, Wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves, that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. 32, Fill you up then the measure of your fathers. 33, You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? These were the words of Jesus Christ, our risen King, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Listen out again, the consequences. Our Lord spoke about hell more than anyone else. The fear of God. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Understanding the gravity of what's at stake, we persuade men. Don't fear them that can kill the body. Fear him who can do what again? Kill the body and the soul. Cast the soul into hell. The fear of God, understanding the consequence of sin, the consequence of disobedience, the consequence of unrighteousness, unrighteousness, understanding that there is a price to pay. There's a consequence. And 
And just like we were grafted in, the Gentiles grafted in, and Paul said to them in Romans, pretty much don't get full of yourself because just like you were grafted in, you can also be taken out. Don't hype on the Jews because you can also lose your place. We think there's no consequence. Have we read the Bible? And this is one of the reasons why every time I do the Bible listen party and we're just focusing on the word and no distractions for however long it takes, there are so many things that come out and then it challenges false doctrines. It challenges all that you've heard. It's almost like, and then when you're asking the Lord to lead you, it, it's doing something on the inside. That's a spiritual work. That's not a work of, of smooth talkers or doctrines of demons or just words that you want to hear, itching ears type of thing. It gets deep when you're by yourself and something is happening. And you're saying, no, Lord, there's something else to this story that we're not being told. And the fear of God is not here anymore. When we look at even whenever the men of old, the fathers, encountered an angel or the Lord, the way they fell upon their faces, the, the, their heart, when they realized that they actually sinned against the Lord, just their disposition, the way they felt. And we're living in a generation when the fear of God is almost non-existent. There might be a few people. And we're living in the age of grace where we can call upon and receive the benefit, but yet still, we still haven't. It's almost like, okay, there's so much. It's not as hard as back then in terms of coming to Jesus, but yet still, we're almost maybe more wicked than the people that we read about. And that's why every time I read about the, the Israelites, and I'm like, man, they just disobeyed the Lord, and the Lord did this to them, and so many died, and the next day, they're sitting again, they're, they're, they're complaining. And I'm like, but I, I have to stop myself really quick and say, Ranzo, we of this generation are just the same or worse than them. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. When we understand that there is a consequence for sin. That it separates us from the master. That it does something to keep us away from fulfilling the Lord's will in our lives. Delaying things. Affecting us. Giving the, the devil a way in. Making our lives a living hell. Not looking anything close to what it should be. Living a, a Christian life that's so mediocre is unrecognizable to what the scripture says. And we wonder why our experience as believers is the way it is. Because again, there's no fear of God. There's no consequence. So it's like, okay, well, all I got to do is this thing. And then but when we're reading the Bible, it's like, wait, I'm not experiencing what I'm seeing. And then we're grappling with that. And then we say, no, God is not real or this. And then we walk away. We deconstruct and all these things. When, we're, when we look at the way we live and look at what we actually see in the word, we can see that there, something is wrong with the picture we're looking at. And if we actually understood this and I had the fear of God, then we would say, no, wait. He says these, these things. Be holy as I'm holy. Seek me with all your heart. Draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. Love me with everything within you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do all these things. Okay. The Lord doesn't answer the prayer or hear the prayers of the wicked. And all these different things that we're seeing and we're like, okay, wait, there's a pattern here. Where do I fall, Lord? But before we even look in the word, we're just saying, okay, well, I don't know. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, I don't know what's happening. But if we examine our hearts and realize there's a consequence for the way we're living, that God is holy and righteous, of course, indeed, and the Holy Spirit is very sensitive and easily grieved. It's a privilege, an opportunity, a, 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 a blessing, an honor. It's a privilege to house the Holy Spirit. If we even have him.
There's no fear of God at all. Even myself, I got to be searching my heart. I'm like, okay, Lord, all right. And the thing is, when you get a taste, you understand again of one was possible, and you're just getting getting a glimpse. The Lord just gave you a glimpse, so you realize when you're not there, you're like, no man, something is wrong. You're like, no, the way something is off. So you know what you're missing because you you've got a you got a glimpse before. And even if you've never gotten to the place where you got a glimpse, the word is there that shows you what's possible. It shows you what's possible. You can see how these men lived. And then if we look at ourselves, these people aren't superhumans, okay? Because the Bible even said, again, Elijah had like passions like us. He's just like us. But yesterday he prayed and this happened. Why? There was something because the Bible also says God is no respecter of persons. And I was even thinking about the fact that Moses only got to see the promised land. The Lord brought him up to the mountain and told him, okay, look, you can see, but then you're going to die here. So Moses never got to enter because what? He never sanctified the Lord in the midst of the children of Israel by the rock. He told him to speak to the rock and water will flow forth, but he smite the rock twice. That's all Moses did. Moses did. And he was disqualified from entering in to the land, the promised land. Can you imagine that? Moses, who spoke to the Lord face to face, the Bible says, clear as day, conversations. Moses. So when I read that, I'm like, Mo I'm like Moses? And when you actually read from Genesis all the way to, to uh, in the last six days, we, we, got, we went from Genesis all the way through to Deuteronomy, and we're going to the entire Bible, you, you read that, you realize, Moses, that's what Moses did? He smote the rock twice instead of speaking to it, and, and then you will not enter in, and Aaron died? And wh what have we done lately? What are we doing? And we think we can live any way that we want and expect to experience what we see in the word. The Bible says explicitly, God is no respecter of persons. Which means, even the men in the same Bible that we read, these men of old, we can also walk as they did. Because the Bible talks about a broken spirit, a contrite heart, God will not despise. These are principles in terms, of the, in terms of the way God interacts with humanity. We can learn these things by going to the word. And we, when we see how these men lived and walked, we understand now what? Okay, if Elijah can do this and Elijah can do that and Apostle Paul can do this and Peter can do this and all these people can walk this way and John can walk this way and all these things, they're not aliens. They are humans just like you and I, and God is no respecter of person. So anyone that seek him with their whole heart, anyone that walk in accordance with his ways and not make excuses and have a false doctrine and say, well, it doesn't matter, all these things, even though when you look at your life, you're not leaving nothing close to what's in the Bible. And I've been there, and I challenge myself. Now, like, the reason why your life is not the way it is that you, what you see in the Bible is because you're not living in accordance with God's standards. That's why. Because God is 100%. I'm not making any excuses for the way I'm living. You're not living right, Ranzo. Fix it. Then we blame God. Oh, this is not happening. This is not happening. Ah, so, something is wrong. Really? Have you, how, how is your heart? Have you checked it? Have you forgiven that person? No, but still, it doesn't matter. Are you treating your wife okay? It, well, it doesn't matter. The Bible says your prayers will be hindered. Oh, there's, there's a consequence to that? Oh, I, um, I hate all these people. I treat these people like nothing. Um, in, in the church, like I'm partial. If they have money, I treat them one way. If they're poor, I treat them another way. But the Bible actually spoke against that. Are you doing that? Do you help the poor? Well, I don't have enough money. To, well, you know. Are you caught up in sexual immorality? You're doing this all the time and you're just asking God for, to forgive you and it's like, okay, well, I slipped again. Oh, Lord, forgive me. 
and you're, exp you're expecting to have the same experience. The Bible talk about resisting sin to blood, like, like really resisting. Have you really gone to that place? So I'm talking to every single person that's watching this video and myself. I'm not making any excuses whatsoever. We can't expect, again, to have the experience we ought to have if we're not living according to God's standards. When we start walking as we ought to walk, then we will see the, the power. We will see the true love. We will see the experience. Then and only then will our life become the word of God. We will start experiencing the Bible. We will start living the Bible until that day we will we, we'll be lukewarm, mediocre, making excuses, saying, well, God is not doing this anymore and all these things because we love our sin way too much. When we are commanded to love the Lord with all of our minds, all of our souls, all of our heart, all of our strength. The fear of God is non-existent. And that's when the church is powerless. And I, you know, it's like you read the Bible and when you read the, actually read the Bible, you believe it, you get so frustrated. One, with yourself first. Because you look at your own self and you say, no, I remember the first time. I was like, no. I'm like, I'm not nowhere close. I'm what's happening. I'm not making up a doctrine to suit my shortcoming like people who are living in sin and forming an entire doctrine around that just so they can feel comfortable to continue as they are. So you look at yourself, you're reading the word, you're like, man, the word is reading me. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing these things, 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 I'm like, Lord, something is wrong, Father. There's no way you have so many pages talking about these things and it's inconsequential. There's no way that you wasted your time to preserve all this. And it's like, I just, it doesn't matter. Why am I reading it anyway? You could have made one page. You could have made one sentence. What about a pamphlet? Give me a little pamphlet like this, Lord. How about a pamphlet like this? It's easy to memorize. I, I could walk around with a pamphlet like this, right? Like a post-it note. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll just say this and say this and show it to other people to say this. And, and we're cool. We're good, right? Okay. Why, why are you going to give me this big thing? Why, why give me this big thing that when like Ranzo, for instance, say a Bible is in party, we're going to go to the entire Bible in 40 days. People don't even show up for it because it's, why? The word is not important. And then if I look at the Bible, it's so, look at this Bible. It's intimidating. I can't read all this. But I read Harry Potter in like two nights, three nights, and all these other books so quick. But the Bible is just too boring. I, I can't understand it. <sighs> Why this? Why this? And not this? The God of all wisdom. Why, why not this? Why this? Why? There must be a reason. Why is the old? Why, why is the New Testament still? Why, why is still so many? Yeah, the Old Testament is way you know a lot longer, but the New Testament still is so a lot, a lot of words, a lot of uh, a lot of books, a lot of letters. Why? One letter would suffice. One line, maybe. One verse, probably, maybe two. And we actually believe these things. This must be God because I don't even know why, but I just feel I just feel this so strong, you know. And and someone would someone you know like people usually say like they feel the Lord. I'm like okay, I, I guess I'm feeling the Lord right now. I'm like that's um, that must be what I'm feeling with what I'm feeling right now talking about this. So the life we're living, you know, as I was sharing with with someone today, um, this family, it's like Jesus is literally going around knocking on doors trying to find people who are available. The Lord is ready to move. And I shared this before. He's ready to move in your life, in your family, in your community, in your work, in your school, in your job, in your business, in your city, in your ward, in your region, in your country, in your province. On your continent, he's ready to move. But again, he's trying to find people who are available and ready to give it all. God is waiting. Do you think the Lord who is patiently waiting for the fullness of the, of the harvest to come in if if he's not ready to pour out on every single person that's willingly available the God who we are saying is, is, is a God of love 
You think he's keeping all the things that are necessary and can turn the world upside down to himself because he just want to hug it when he's the one that actually gave us the Great Commission. But you and I, like myself, I'm so busy doing my own thing. I'm so preoccupied with my own life, my own success, my own relationship, my own comfort is more important, Lord, than your vision for the world. Lord Jesus, you died in vain. Why did you die? Why did you send for the Holy Spirit, Lord? Why did you do it? Why? You died so I could be comfortable, Lord. In my 70 years, to be comfortable, to live in the biggest house I can actually get, the nicest car I can buy. The Lord is searching the world, trying to find those who are available and billions of Christians on the planet. And yet still he can't even find. He's searching. Are you available, Ranzo? No, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm not available. And I haven't been available for the longest time because I'm preoccupied doing my own thing, my insignificant pursuit. And he's knocking and he's calling you. That's watching, he's calling you. Are you available? Knock, knock. Oh, they're not available. Let me go to the next house, next door. Are you available? Next house, no answer. Are you available? Are you available? He's ready to move. But he can't find a man. He can't find a woman. He can't find nobody. And that's why when he finds a man or a woman that's ready, he just pour out everything. And then we hold this one man in high regard. When the Lord can't find, he's looking, he's looking, he can't find one person. So when he finds someone that is willing to die to themselves truly, he just pour everything out into them. Because he just went to like two billion Two million houses. No one is available. So the first person he saw who was actually ready, he just poured it out. And then that one person now is taking the world by storm. And then we make excuses. And then we don't read the Bible. We don't know what it says anyway. So uh, someone preached his sermon. Uh, it sounds good. Person, you know, is a great speaker, you know, and makes sense to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, I like the church. You know, I, I like the experience. And we never thought, we never, we never, the thought never entered our minds to actually search what the Bible says for ourselves. We, we, we never committed ourselves at least trying to finish in it. We never tried to actually see what it actually says. You know, just like this guy, I remember this, this, this Catholic guy was listening to his, his, his uh, testimony and he was saying that he went through he never knew like he was reading this Bible and then he actually got another Bible and started reading it and realized, oh, you can't actually, you know, pray to like, you know, saints and bow down to like statues and all these things. And he's like, wait, hold up, what's happening? All these things, so many things. He's like, well, hold up. Even when Jesus said this, he's like, what? So this whole time you weren't, re you, you lived in a country where you could buy the Bible, you could listen to the audio Bible and you could go online and type in something and, read but it wasn't that important to you and and many of us have been there myself i'm saying and we say we're followers of jesus christ and we just again the reality is this right this is a reality just like i just read through we listened to and followed followed along the book of deuteronomy and I was, i'm looking at wow like all they gotta do is just listen to this thing like what the lord said like moses just said okay do this and this would be what you would receive. And so they had a choice. And he said, he said, like, heaven and earth will be a witness to you this, this day. I gave you blessing and cursing. Pretty much life and death. Look, you literally got to choose. You got two things before you. And they chose the worst part. 
they were chosen by the Lord, but they, they abused that relationship and that privilege, and then they suffered the consequences when they had two things before them to choose, and they chose the, the worst thing. And just like us right now, we have all this, the access with the Father through His Son, and then we have the other side to live for the world and all these other things, but we choose the worst part. So just like them, we chose the worst part. Just like Adam and Eve, they chose the worst part. And, and we, in the last days, the last days Christians, we haven't learned yet. But we claim You know, the truth of the matter is, when you read the word, any one of us, and believe what we read, like read it for yourself, no preconceived notions, I'm not taking any baggage into the word, I'm not trying to read the word and to try to make it the way that I want to read it and make you feel comfortable, You're like someone, uh, I think left a comment on the other channel about the fact that, well, this is not a God I know, and I'm like, but this is what the Bible says, so you, you don't believe what the Bible so, okay, you're making a God in your own image. Cool. All right. We read it. Then we realize, okay, all right. Um, my, li my life is not, it's not this, Lord. Something is wrong. What's wrong? Is your word wrong? Did you not mean what you say? Something is off. How am I living? How am I living, Lord? How many things have you said I should do that I'm not doing and I'm doing the, ne the things that I shouldn't be doing and I still expect to get the benefits of the ones that you say do these things? I don't, okay, so I should get the benefits but I'm not doing this thing. But I've never tried to actually do the things that you say. I don't see the importance of actually really trying Resisting unto blood. Really trying to love you with everything within me. That depth of love, I've not even approached that place yet. So I might as well, I might even die not truly knowing what it means to experience the Bible, to live as you have called us to live. And we will think that the apostles were superhuman and all these other people were made from a different cloth. They're not humans like you and I. And that you only reserve these things for these people, Lord. But your Bible, your word says we're not, you know, no respect of persons. But then when we start, you know, I did an interview and the person said you only need one, just one person to come in, just one. That's what God needs. One lost soul to come to the light. Just one. And he can start with that one. And that one can do so many things. Twelve disciples who truly know G knew Jesus Christ. And gave it all up to follow him. Denying themselves. And truly. And because of their sacrifice. Their devotion. Their commitment. You and I are here today. And we can read. We can read the Bible and learn more. And the question then becomes, how many more people are going to be walking in darkness because you and I refuse to truly live and walk with Jesus, receive what we need, and then go out there and also shine the light and give other people the opportunity to enter in. But the fear of God, again, is non-existent. So uh, there's no... Motivation to try to be obedient. There's none. It's like, why? I'm good. I'm comfortable. I'm all right. I don't know that I'm actually in, in danger of hell, but I'm still living as though I think I'm going to make heaven. So, hey, why sweat? Why fret? Why do anything else? I'm good. Just like how the devil likes it. Just like how he likes it.
you know, someone might say, Renzo, you're talking, why are you talking so strong? Like you're perfect. Why are you talking so strong? Like you've never sinned. Why are you talking so strong? Like you never had struggles yourself. The first person that this message is preached to is me. And when I go through the word myself, and I see that I'm nowhere close, I'm like, no, I'm in danger of what? Hell fire. Yes, I accepted Jesus. Yes, I did all the stuff that, you know, people say that's all you're going to do and you're good. Yes, but I was in danger of hell fire. And I never knew that what I read in the Bible was possible in my own life. And I got a glimpse, I got a taste, and I realized. So one, my life started to change when I endeavored to actually want the word. Ranzo, you can't watch this. Ranzo, you can't do this. Ranzo, you can't, you know, talk to your wife this way. You can't do all these things or whatever it is. You can't do these things and expect to experience and expect the Lord to hear and answer your prayers and expect. Why can't you, Ranzo? Because the Bible says so. And I'm just a, a dust particle on the earth. I'm just flesh and blood. And the God who made the cosmos said what he said. So I can't impose my will on him. I have to fall in alignment with his will and then I can move in accordance with what he has prescribed and allowed to happen. So my life started to change. Oh, drawing closer to Christ actually released his struggle. Cool. I don't have to look at anything. I don't have to do these things. All these things that people talk about, you can't overcome. By the grace of God, you can overcome. You have internet, but you don't, you, you never ever type a thing. You never look at anything. You never go on your phone and do, you never, because of the power of God, you understand the fear of God and the consequences of all of your actions. And you understand if you want proximity to the Lord, you, you have to die to your flesh. It's not a question. And the life and experience you have with Jesus that you think you have is not enough. You know it's deficient. You know it is. You know you read the Bible and you're wondering why the Bible is so... What am I reading? I don't see this. I don't experience it. What's happening? You. That's, that's what's happening. You are blocking it to yourself. You are standing in your own way. So all of us who make excuses all the time. So the very first thing is to, to realize that most people won't even get there because again, hey, no fear of God. There's no consequence. So most people won't even explore the idea. And that is the greatest travesty. And the devil loves it so much because we won't even explore it because it is not necessary, bro. Come on. You're doing too much. And we don't see it. So that's the, that's the worst part. We won't even explore the idea that there's more. We won't even explore the idea because, again, all you're going to do is just one that you're good, you're good, bro. You're good forever, dude. You're good. Hey, why? And we don't see the problem with that. So when you actually realize that, okay, well, this is keeping me away from, keeping me away from the Lord. It's uh, delaying the Lord's will for my life. It's just doing so many things in my life that's not right. When we understand the consequences, then we, we, we try to change and be different. Like, okay, and people will say, oh, you can't, you're saying to change. Oh my gosh, don't use those words. But how many things have you changed in your own life? You have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a wife, a husband maybe, and then you realize, okay, they don't like certain things and you're like, okay, you got to change. It's a, is this a crime? So, if people who actually read business books and personal development books and all these things to actually learn different habits and all these books that we can read to change something so we can have a better experience in life, um, it's a crime, actually. So when you read the Bible and it says do something and you're not currently doing it, if you try to change to do it, it's a crime and you shouldn't do it. But the Bible says to do it. And I listened to the person that said that rubbish and not what the Bible says. Then, so when you start trying, right, you're on a journey. And so something you used to struggle with, 
it's no longer a struggle because you realize that, okay, actually it's super dangerous and the fear of the Lord actually grips you and you realize that, okay, I want the Holy Spirit to, to abode, to abide within me too, to be with me and I don't want to grieve him because he's very, very sensitive. So that within itself, when you're drawing closer to the Lord, you're doing practical things and you realize, okay, wow, the Lord in his power and strength and grace because he saw you, that your heart was actually after him, you're actually doing your part then he gives you the grace and then he removes these things. It doesn't even cross your mind anymore. How is that possible, Lord, after how many years? Because of you, Father. But while I still was in love with my sin, I couldn't get rid of it. So, there's a difference and there's a way to actually leave and change and look more like Christ. There's a way there's a way. It's possible. And then what happens is, then the devil starts attacking you, but before he wasn't attacking you. You were fine. So now you're getting attacked by the devil, and you're just like, so why are you attacking me now? Am I doing something that I shouldn't be doing? It must be something right, because the devil does not like any of us to get close to the Lord and to become actually a serious Christian, because it means it's a threat to his kingdom. So, so Satan always again shows his hands. So you know when you're on the right path, oh, he's coming now, but he wasn't coming over there. And the way I was living over there wasn't in accordance with the Bible. It was different. I was fine, you know, just living my life, doing my thing, you know. Everyone struggles and everyone does what I'm doing. Say, so, hey, what's the problem? I'm fine. Come on, man. But there's, the devil's not there. But the moment you actually really start trying to live the Bible, first, you realize your life starts to change. So you realize that the things that were seemingly impossible and that you shouldn't do that people say in the lukewarm church and stuff is actually possible and you're doing it and you're, you're having a better experience and the Bible is, is coming alive in your life and you realize that, okay, these people are still in darkness. They don't understand what they're talking about. But when you actually try to realize and then they never start coming and you're like, why are you coming now? Oh, you see that I'm actually, the blindfolds are gone. The deception is removed. I'm, I'm, I'm fidgeting with this thing and I'm moving so I can see a little light. So now you're coming to, to pull it back over my eyes so I can just go back to the group and just be as you want me to be because you don't want me to threaten your kingdom. Because again, God is looking for a man. God is looking for a woman, but we aren't available and there's no one really. So, he, so he's relaxing and he's busy running the world. But only, only a very small percentage of us are going to get it. A very, very small percentage. The vast majority of people that will see this video are probably going to dislike it and and say, so, okay, nah, bro, like, you don't know what you're talking about. The vast majority, maybe one person, literally, whatever, maybe uh, uh, 500 people might watch this video over time, 500 views or something. One person from the 500 might actually say, oh, there's something here. One person. One. And the devil loves that, man. He loves it so much. He loves it. He loves it, man. He loves when you look at the church and the world is the same thing in the church, might be even worse than the world. Looking at us who should be living like Christ and we, we look worse than those who don't even know Christ. We're living worse than them. Because we can do the worst things and we're like, oh, we're covered forever, man. <laughs> like It doesn't matter. I just, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. You know, I know I was just a horrible human just now, but you know, this flesh, Lord, this flesh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> this flesh. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us, Father. The Lord of the... Oh, Lord. I just ask for your mercy, Lord God. We're living in the final days of human history, Lord God, and we're not there yet. And it's probably going to really take, Lord God, the persecution that you told me about to, to turn all of us, our hearts, back to you. Like what happened in Acts 8. It's coming, Lord, indeed. Oh, help me, Lord God. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. And when you show us these truths, Oh God, preserve it in our lives, oh God. That we won't vacillate and turn back to our vomits, Abba Father. 
that we would allow the enemy to draw us away from the light back into darkness, our Father, in a state of complacency and false cities and falsehoods. O oh God of mercy upon our lives, our Father. O oh Lord God, raise up more people. Raise up more people, Lord God, in the world, our Father, truly, who live your word. So there are more examples of a father of how we ought to walk so we can see it, Lord God, and not just read it, Abba Father, and think this thing was only restricted to the period in which the Bible actually took place, Abba Father. Cause us, send us examples, Abba, have mercy upon us, O oh Father, not just for our own sakes, but those people who are still in darkness and they're hungry and thirsting for for you O oh god but there's not a man not a woman of a father available the truly turn lord god their cities upside down have mercy upon us O oh god we have so much riches but we're so wretched and poor we have so much but so little at the same time, Father. But your spirit of our Father truly is able to do wonders, O oh God. Your word says too that with man it is impossible, but not with God. So Lord God, O oh Father, show us that side. Show us that side of our Father. Show us that side, O oh God of making the impossible possible in our lives, in our generation, O oh God. O oh God, I ask for mercy for my own life. For every viewer of this video, O oh God, I ask for mercy, O oh God. Oh Lord, a revival, as they call it, is, is waiting in every city, every ward, every country, every principality every province, every state, O oh God, every region, every continent. You just need us, O oh God, to get in position of mercy of our Father. Have mercy, Father. Have mercy, O oh God. And bring forth a change for your glory and that, will, that which will make you pleased with the way that we're walking, the way that we're teaching, the way that we're preaching, the way that we're leading. In Jesus' name, Holy One of Israel. Amen. Guys, that's the message for today. Um, I wasn't planning to, but the Lord really gripped me throughout uh, the Bible listening party today, and I I felt like I was gonna go to sleep because I was you know I was on the road all day, and then I came home and I did the Bible listening party like three hours, and I'm like okay I'm gonna you know go to sleep, and and then I'm just like man I gotta do Faith Friday now I'm not gonna wait until the morning my time, and I just came on and. I trust I did the Lord's will. And I'll leave you guys with this again. I remember the, I've encountered Satan three times. And the second time he came, he said to me again, I know the Lord told you about Matthew 6. And we went through Matthew 6 in one of the videos we did. And Matthew 6, 33, 33 was what I was living. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Something shifted, something changed when I took those words to heart. 
something shifted, something changed. And when I stop living those words, something again, I reverted back to old ways. I reverted back to old experiences. So just like a man can step into light and step backwards into darkness, you're in a alleyway or in a dark house and you step out into the light, you can also step back into the darkness. And there's a different experience. So when I was living that, and so much so, so intense that my life was changing so much that Satan himself, because he sent demons first, and this might sound strange to some of you guys, and I usually don't talk about these things. I had never experienced these things until I started taking Jesus seriously. That's when I realized, oh, these things I've heard from people are true. Then he came himself because the demons weren't working. I could handle those. But then he came. Oh, I know the Lord showed you the power source. He gave you one of the secrets. Uh. Where was he before? Where was he? Where was he? Satan has limited resources. Limited resources. So he only goes after people who start taking the Lord seriously. So it's like, okay, that person over there, that person over there, send reinforcement. Oh, that person is no threat. Oh, it's fine. Just keep watching them, whatever. Oh, this person is getting out of order, becoming a potential threat. Send more demons. Send more threat. You, you got to stop this person. Limited resources. Wrestle not against flesh and blood. Cool. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. Not just in word, not just in thought, but in deed. And I remember again, I can only talk about my own experience because I'm my own self. I can't talk about my mother. I can't talk about my wife. Well, I guess, you know, I know my wife, of course, but still in her mind, she knows her own mind, right? I can't talk about any other human, but I can talk about myself and where I was. I can't talk about what I see other people doing. I can't talk about what I see. I could talk about my observation in the church, but I can talk about, talk about myself and see a new when I decided to live the word instead of just reciting the word. And something changed. And there will be people who would actually push back. There will be Christians who would actually push back. Christians who would actually push back. And you ask them a question, how are you living? Can you be honest with me, please? How are you living? How is your life? Would you actually be honest? You're pushing back. Of course, I'm saying I used to be lukewarm. I used to live this way, live for myself, all these things. But now I'm living for the kingdom. I'm seeking for the kingdom. Truly, that God is number one. I would lose jobs or opportunities, money. I don't care. God, number one, like truly. I'm trying to live in accordance with his word. And my life is actually changing. How are you living? You're pushing back on me. How are you living? How? How are your relationships? Your spouse, your children? Um, anger issues maybe? No. Immorality probably? No. Your life is a mess but you're pushing back. As someone who's actually trying to live the word. And you don't see that, see that there's a problem. That you too can experience and change but no fear of God, no consequences. But your life does not look like the Bible because you're not even trying. You're not even trying at all. We're pushing back on righteousness. And the other day I was thinking to myself, the Bible says, oh, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. And for some reason, for the very first time in my life, I, I saw it a different way. I'm like, wait. Because everyone who says they're a believer in Jesus actually just take hold of, of that scripture to say, well, righteousness i'm like i'm a christian so yeah i'm being persecuted for being a christian but blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake so I, I don't know for some reason you know you're reading bible sometimes and things just take on a different meaning one day you're just like wait i never saw this this uh verse this way before then one day comes and you read it and it just took on like take on a different meaning and i was like wait people who actually say righteousness matters are being persecuted 
and not even by, well, yeah, people in the world, but mostly by other Christians. So if you dare to say righteousness or, oh, they think they're better than I am, or you think you're better than I am, you, you think you're this, you think you're that, because somebody's actually trying to live the word. And so blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You're trying to live righteous. You're trying to live based on God's standards and his commands to you. And you're being persecuted for it. That's another way to look at the scripture. It just came to me. I never saw it that way before, ever. I'm like, Lord, are you saying something here? That's why we hate our brothers and sisters in the church. That's why we're full of envy and jealousy and strife and pursuing vain glory, carnal things, all the things that we read in the Bible. And Paul said, aren't you yet carnal? Jealous, envious, fighting, backbiting, unforgiveness, all these things. I'm just human. Oh, it's the same thing with everything else in life, man. Oh, I was born in the ghetto, man. Yeah, bro, like there's nothing I can do about it. My parents never had the opportunity. There's nothing I can do about it. Then somebody is born in the same ghetto. They see their parents' circumstance. Yeah, I know my parents never had a, a you know a chance, an opportunity. I was born in the ghetto just like you, but man, I, I'm gonna find a way out. I gotta get out. And there's a different experience. It's the same thing with the church. There are those who are just like, oh, man, come on, bro. I'm a sinner, bro. I'm a sinner, dude. You know, <coughs> long video. Yeah, um, I'm going to end there. Like, you know, I kind of went off and I think it's time to close the video still, but I just hope, you know, one, that my life, you know, I stay, I stay centered because it's so easy to veer off track. You can be on fire today. And bone cold tomorrow, lukewarm tomorrow. It's very, very easy. It's so hard to get to a place of being serious. And so easy, easy to fall back. So easy to fall back. So easy. Because the devil is constantly trying. He doesn't want one soul to be saved. One, 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 one. It's so easy. But hopefully, you know, again, that one person that's going to see this, that one person, one, out of eventually maybe 500 views, one person, just one person is going to take this seriously. One. And again, you know what? It's, um, it's, I can only share, you know, I can only share and then I can only live these things that's all i can do i can i can think about it the bible <laughs> i'm looking at the bible my bible is open at second timothy three second timothy three and i just i just turned over here and i'm looking at verse what's this verse three that says knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers 
walking after their own lusts. <laughs> wow, I'm just... Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I wasn't planning to bring this at all, but it came out. And uh, so I think the Lord is saying something. And I, again, each of us, man, you can try. You can read, you read, and then you pray. You see the Lord. You try to draw, draw as close to him as possible and ask him for strength and grace. And Lord, I want to do your will. Father, help me, Lord Jesus. Cause, you know, cause me to please you. Help me, etc. All these things, you know. Help me to die to myself. All, all this stuff. Really praise you and pray in everything that the Lord has said in his word that you feel like you can't do. Pray all of them. Lord, please, this, these are your will. Please help me. And you're really going after it. You're doing all the things. And with the hope that one day the Lord is going to hear and answer your prayer and draw you out from the pit. And then use that experience of what he's teaching you to just like tell other people. And again, some people aren't going to believe and just like when the day of Pentecost, some people laughed, some mocked, some did this. When our Lord and Master was sharing, preaching as well, some people laughed, teaching. You know, some people mocked, some people believed, some people never believed. So again, it's going to be the same thing. Every single uh, message, every single time you try to evangelize, again, it's going to be a percentage. Some will believe a very small percentage will, percentage will, and then most will, you know, perplex, confused, unbelief, scoff, whatever. Uh, but the goal is, one, you make sure you strive to walk as you ought to walk. Like walk the word, walk the thoughts, right? Like the righteous thoughts, just live it and just do that and then share. And uh, when your time comes and the Lord is like, okay, come home, you can examine your life and say, okay, Lord, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've done what you call me to do. Um, you know, blessed be your name. It's time to go home. And then you go and then when the final judgment come, <coughs> comes and all of us, and comes and all of us stand before the Lord, he will judge everyone righteously and all of us will get our just recompense. He'll know the motives and know the truth and all these things. And then all of us will definitely get exactly what uh, righteous judgment, right? All of us will get exactly what it is that the Lord uh, sees that is our righteous uh, judgment. If we were actually living for Christ and, and all these things, he knows, right? So again, just... Work out your own salvation. Like, take it seriously, man. Like, most of us aren't taking it seriously. Uh, take it seriously. And when you see someone trying to take it seriously, don't be the person that's going to try to, like, fight them and persecute them because they're actually trying to live the word. Don't do it because you're going to use, you're using your own life. And you want to feel comfortable the way you're living. So when someone else is coming with, coming with something else, you're like, nah, hold up, bro. If you're living that way, you're telling me that I then... I'm in jeopardy because if you were living just just like me and now you're living not like me, you're telling me something indirectly and I don't like the way I feel. I'm uncomfortable. So I'm going to attack you for that. Well, take care, guys. That's it for now. You know, one hour, 28 minutes. This has been <laughs> this, is, this has gone on for a long time, but um, uh, I hope and I pray it's not in vain. Um, you know, pray for me. You know, I just prayed for y'all, right? So if you're out there and you're a prayer warrior, pray. You know, I said, Lord, strengthen Ryan to help him uh, to live as you want him to live. Until next time, guys, God bless you all. Bye for now. Take care.